I'm called to order the uh, December 18th uh, meeting of the Los Alamitos Planning Commission. Uh, can I have a roll call, please? Chair Riley. Here. Vice Chair Sofokanik. Here. Commissioner Andrade. Absent. Commissioner Quilty. Absent. Commissioner DeBolt. Absent. Commissioner Gross. Here. Commissioner Lowe. Here. All right, uh, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, agenda item four, presentation. It looks like we have a, a presentation of fiscal sustainability. Staff report? Uh, yes. Uh, presentation. Chair, commission members, uh, as you may be aware, the city has uh, been in the process for the past several months of addressing what we've termed fiscal sustainability. And uh, really it's a matter of looking at uh, projections going forward with regards to revenues versus expenditures and what we have found is we our expenditures are ever increasing uh, and our revenues are not keeping up with that as a result of our findings and our projections uh, about uh, a few months back we decided to uh, conduct a public outreach uh, to really just educate and inform the public as to what's happening why we're facing this situation going forward and that resulted in a number of community meetings so to date we have conducted uh, about eight community meetings I believe <coughs> eight, yes we had five scheduled community meetings where uh, three of those were in community parks two were in in buildings at different times uh, in different days uh, we have probably seen uh, approximately 400 or so participate in the various community events or meetings that we've conducted to date. Uh, we also felt uh, that in addition to the community outreach, uh, two other things that we wanted to do, we wanted to reach out and, and address all of the city staff and receive their input, which we've done, and then also reach out to all the board and commission members. We were hoping to have come to you earlier than this. You're the last commission to, uh, to for us to speak to, uh, it, only because we had a schedule conflict or one of our key staff members had a schedule conflict. Unfortunately, he had a last minute emergency come up and he wasn't able to make it tonight as well. And that's our physical sustainability manager, David Kane. He's a part-time temporary staff member that we brought on, a uh, former finance director uh, for Fountain Valley and other locations that we brought on to provide technical assistance to our team as we go through this process. So uh, what we want to do this evening is to be able to present to you the same uh, PowerPoint presentation that we've done to, uh, so far with the public, and then provide an opportunity uh, for questions and answers as a, uh, uh, after that. So uh, we have, uh, as you can see behind me, we have two of our uh, department directors here. We have our police chief, Eric Nunez, and our finance director, Eric Hendrickson. And Mr. Hendrickson is going to go through the PowerPoint presentation, and again, afterwards, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions and receive input from you at that time. So I'll pass it over to Mr. Hendrickson at this time. Thank you. So as uh, Les mentioned, we have been engaged in community outreach meetings uh, with various groups in the community, uh, a few park meetings, different commission meetings. Uh, we met with the senior club. We met with the Kiwanis club. We're going to meet with the Rotary club soon. Um, but we, what we're really doing is getting the message out there of uh, what we're facing in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, so really, what is the problem? Um, that we've been balancing our budgets the last 10 years by making service cuts um, to cuts the city services and reductions in staffing levels. Uh, projected structural budget deficit is starting uh, next year of approximately uh, just over a million dollars, and it's gonna be growing in the next 20 years, and that's mainly due to pension costs. Uh, this chart right here will show you uh, the red line is our projected expenditures in the next 10 years. The blue line is a little bit more flat. That's our projected revenues. Uh, you'll see right there uh, projected deficit of uh, fiscal year 2021 is about 1.4 million. Um, and then on the very bottom there, you'll see the pension costs. Uh, that's a, just a component of that rising red line. Uh, that yellow line is the pension cost um, payments we make to CalPERS to fund 
uh, current and past employees' pensions. Uh, the budget deficit in about nine years from now, 27-28, is projected to be about $3.4 million. That's the gap between uh, that year's revenue and expenses. Uh, like most other California cities, uh, the state has taken away um, money from each city's coffers. Uh, in 1992, the state uh, took property tax money from each city known as ERAF, Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund. Pretty much they had to balance their own budget, so they took money from each city. Um, since then, it has accumulated to about $12 million that's been taken. That's money that we would have gotten if it wasn't for that act. Um, since then, they have taken that from us, and it continues to be about a $700,000 per year hit to our budget. Um, all of these conditions will result in a depleting general fund cash position in about five years. Uh, this next slide uh, we wanted to show, um, this is a projection of our reserves. Uh, you'll see the first few, the first four years have a green bar of about seven to eight million dollars of cash reserves in the bank. And once we start drawing on those, if we can't balance our budgets going forward, the reserves go down. Um, all cash will be exhausted around fiscal year 24, 25. Uh, but even before that, there's a cash flow, a cash flow issue where we need to have money in the bank to pay our bills. Uh, we only get paid our property taxes twice a year, December and April, when each resident pays their bill. Um, so we need to have money in our bank to sustain ourselves for about six months at a time um, until the big property tax deposits hit our account. Um, so why is this impacting our city? Uh, Prop 13 was enacted in 1978, and that really led to a loss of local control, and that cemented how much property tax each um, each taxing entity um, gets in the county. Uh, for the city of Los Alamitos, we get 11.6 cents of each property tax dollar that you pay. Um, on the flip side, sales tax, um, anytime you pay a sales tax at a store, uh, that is a fixed share of seven and three quarters. The city gets 1% of that. Um, this has left many uh, capital projects uh, unfunded uh, but they still, we still very much need to fund these either now or in the near future. Uh, th this increase in non-controllable costs includes health care, pension costs, um, and even with the, uh, it's called the UAL, the Unfunded Accrued Liability Payment, we have to make two CalPERS every single year to fund the shortfalls that have happened in the, in the last 60 years that we've been a city. E there's two components to CalPERS. The payroll side of things where the employee and the employer pays a actuarial determined percentage of their payroll every two weeks to CalPERS to fund the pension. And then once a year we pay um, a lump sum to CalPERS in July to help make up the unfunded difference of the pension pool. Uh, this year in fiscal year 1920 we paid 1.3 million and that's projected to rise over the next 20 years to almost 2.2 million per year after that. So what have we been doing to deal with this problem? Um, since 2009, we've reduced our staffing levels by about 25 full-time equivalents. We've eliminated various programs and act activities. We now require all city employees to contribute to their own retirement. And we've reorganized departments um, impacting services as well. So the real goal of this fiscal sustainability outreach um, is to develop a solution that provides for maintaining city services that the community enjoys. Uh, local police protection, maintaining streets, community events, crossing yards, everything you think that the city does on a service level, these are the things we are proud to do and we wanna keep doing for the residents. Some of the potential service cuts, um, if we can't, um, find solutions, we can eliminate recreation and senior services programs, cut the general fund contribution to uh, residential paving and parks. We can restructure police services as crossing guards, youth programs, contract out even more of planning and development services and public works. Um, but most, none of these things even address the $3 million gap that's coming in the near future. On the flip I, uh, side. Can I just pause for a second? Sure. I'd, I'd like to just note um, for the record that Art DeBolt just showed up. Uh, sorry for the interruption. You're good. You're good. Carry on. So, since you interrupted, you mentioned the 
that employees are now funding <coughs> their own their own retirement plans. What Correct. exactly does that mean? You, it, do we still offer a uh, a pension yes, plan so, here at the so, city? Um, mm -hmm. If any full time employee in the city um, has to be part of CalPERS pension plan, the city doesn't put into Social Security. In lieu of that, we put into the state pension plan, and so that did, there is an employer side of payroll and an employee deduction from your paycheck. In the past, the employer used to pick up both of those. Okay. So now, um, across the board, and this has been in place, I think, for over 10 years now, that the employee pays their full fair share and the employer pays their full share as well. On the flip side, the potential revenue enhancement options, uh, we can do a parcel tax, a sales tax, there's uh, increases to utility users taxes, adjusting hotel TOT taxes, and even a recreation fee uh, increase to get a full cost recovery option. As you can see here, the utility users tax, the, the hotel bed tax, um, those options are very minimal in the grand scheme of things. The only two real options on the table that would make sense financially would be a parcel tax or a sales tax. Those are the two numbers that are required to reach that $3 million gap. If a solution isn't found, um, we will still strive for a balanced budget every year, but that will result in a further uh, elimination of programs, neighborhood safety programs, elimination of community events, potentially a decrease in police protection, uh, elimination of s school crossing guards, senior programs, all the services that the residents currently enjoy. Potential solution um, is a local funding measure. As I mentioned, the property tax option or a sales tax option um, would give the city local control and really fund the local needs that we have. Any uh, local funding cannot be touched by the state. It's in the state constitution that if a property tax or sales tax initiative was to occur, the state can't take it away at that point. And that's money that would stay in Los Alamitos. Many other cities have utilized local sales tax measures to maintain fiscal stability. Uh, these measures aren't applied to food purchases like groceries and medications or services. Uh, visitors to Los Alamitos would pay their fair share. It's any, it applies to any purchase in the city limits. Um, and the one cent sales tax measure would generate approximately $3.1 million. So like uh, our interim city manager said, we've gone around and presented this uh, brief slideshow to different residents. And we really wanna get feedback from them and see where they're at, see what's palatable, see if they have ideas, see where, pretty much where the city should be going in the next 20 years. The city council hasn't decided on any of these items yet. Nothing's being forced to them, um, but we will be presenting to them next month on January 14th. Uh, we're gonna have a special fiscal sustainability workshop to present all of these options, uh, get their feedback, because they're the official um, decision makers. And then we're also gonna present to them the results of a statistical survey that went out uh, this past month to get um, voter, um, how do I say this, voter, um, it was a statistical survey on registered voters in the city um, to get their feedback on these issues as well. Um, up here is my contact information. I'm the finance director and uh, less mentioned David Kane. He's our fiscal sustainability manager. Please email us, reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, we're always looking for suggestions, feedbacks, and any questions you may have. And that, that concludes the presentation tonight. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer. <coughs> Chair, Commission members, if I could add to, um, as, as Dave, or excuse me, as as Eric mentioned, there's there's no solution, or we haven't identified a solution, haven't made a recommendation. Uh, we've really brought this about to stir or stimulate uh, community interest and feedback, and we've received a lot of that. We're receiving more through the survey that was just completed. Those results will be coming out shortly, uh, and. Even though there's talk about uh, enhancement and cuts, it really our interest here is not to persuade or dissuade anything, but rather to leave it open for good constructive feedback to be provided, that information to be gathered and given to our the city council so they can make an informed decision going forward or decisions going forward. So I just want to emphasize that, that our objective, our interest right now is just to receive uh, feedback 
uh, to answer questions. And again, either through your dialogue today or further outreach with either David Kane or Eric Hendrickson or directly to council, uh, we just want to make sure that it, uh, all of the information is on the table and again, uh, informed decisions can be made going forward. So with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions or receive any comments you may have. Thank you. Uh, question? Yeah, you mentioned a survey that went out when? <coughs> It, it was during the uh, during the month of uh, November, and it was a statistical survey. 300 registered voters were contacted uh, in the community, so it wasn't an out, a survey for everybody. They were uh, identified based on uh, uh, participating in, I think, the last two elections. Uh, it was a combination of phone surveys as well as uh, electronic distribution as well uh, for surveys to be done online. So. There were 300 people randomly selected throughout the community based on registered voters that have participated in the last two elections. I have a question. Um, did I understand you correctly in that um, we're making what amount to catch up payments on pension liabilities over the past 60 years? It sounded like we yeah, weren't so appropriately funded or? Yeah, so when the, the city's been in, in existence for about 60 years now, and since then the, they've been a part of CalPERS promising pensions to um, the employees and eventually when they retire these lifetime payments um, with the actuarial um, the actuarial the actuaries determine how pensions are funded through future investment gains and so when the stock market crashes when the stock market booms uh, when life expectancy fluctuates uh, when employee count jumps when employee count drops all of these things affect um, the pension pool and the, its funding status. So at the end of the day, the actuaries at CalPERS determine how much the city is either overfunded or underfunded to pay out these promised benefits to its retirees. And, and it sounds like we're currently underfunded and we're yes, trying to... Yes, and, and that's about to the tune of $18.5 million underfunded. Okay. And, and if I could add to that, that's not a... Los Alamitos specific matter. That's a statewide matter. So that's well, I, I, it's a huge unfunded pension liabilities are huge, like everywhere. I mean, it's a big problem. <laughs> so I'm aware of that. I was just and that had curious. to do with PERS projections, right? Correct. That yep. were basically <clears throat> unrealistic. Yeah, I mean, uh, they they just dropped their um, expected investment return recently from seven and a half to seven. Um, so some years, you know, they make 10%. Some years they make 6%. So every year, just determine, just based on the market, what they invest in is, I knew those things, I, <laughs> I'd be in good shape, but I don't, <laughs> so. So what, time, what type of accountability do, does anybody have with, with CalPERS, you know, for those type of miscalculations? I, I understand that it's, it's difficult to, you know, predict certain things, but yeah. I mean, that's their job. Yeah. I mean, now, it and, really and I also know that there are other organizations that you know that properly fund their pensions and, and manage that stuff um, a lot better than than local and state municipalities um, seem to do. Yeah, correct. I mean, there's uh, Calpers has a board of governors. Um, I think it's like an 18-person board that determines the policies they make, um, what they invest in. Uh, sometimes <coughs> they get handcuffed on you know, being a socially responsible investor versus going for the best return, um, where they put their money, um, what the projections are, where they think the future stock market's going. Do they invest more in stocks and bond, stocks versus bonds, government treasuries, foreign markets? I mean, all, all these things factor into the decisions they make. But at the end of the day, they're telling us we they want to average about 7% on their investment pool. So when it doesn't come in at that 7%, an unfunded liability presents itself because these benefits have to be paid out to the retirees, but the, but the funding just isn't there for it if the stock market doesn't return. Or even if like the... Uh, That's probably not, not necessarily the stock market, it's probably more so uh, fixed incomes. And oh yeah, I mean, if, if all the retirees live 10 years longer than the mortality tables that they're projecting off of, more unfunded liability exists then. So there's, there's a lot of different factors that go into this. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Just comments. 
I mean, it's like beating a dead horse, but I mean, I, I remember sitting up here in this seat in 19, nine, from 1998 to 2002 with no experience, in, I'm self-employed, always been self-employed, no experience with pension funds, okay? But I can remember distinctly the financial, uh, our uh, uh, Gerard Goodhart, who ran the, uh, the money side, but the finance, uh, head of finance here, coming in, and this is when the, we were changing the retirement, the years going from, I don't know, going up to 55 and getting uh, they, they increased two or two and a half, three percent or something like, you know, yeah. and I'm not quite, I'm under, get, and of course then they show the projections from PERS at the time, which were like uh, nine, ten, ten percent projections mm -hmm. when, and I'm going, you know, and, and the market, we were, it was steaming along yeah. at that time, and I said, doesn't that seem to be kind of high. I mean, wouldn't you be projecting at that time in the five and maybe six percent rates? I mean, look, looking at what you can get in the bank and in, in T-bills and stuff like that, which were, and, and you're projecting higher than that, which you should really probably be in more the, you know, that, that type of a range. Oh, no, no, it's just going to go on and on. And the council bought it, listened to them. Including me, I mean, I will. I mean, but I'm relying at that point upon seasoned council members who had been here and staff members who had been here. No offense to the staff that's here, by the way, uh, but but I mean, you know, unfortunately, common sense didn't prevail, and it still doesn't prevail. I mean, they're losing money if they lower their projections right now. I mean, what do you get in the bank? A point, mm -hmm. if you're lucky, maybe two, and. Uh, mm -hmm you know, uh, you're still using projections at 7%. So what's the solution? You gotta vote them out. I mean, you know, we're, I don't know. I mean, so that's that's it. I guess the, my comment or question, did you look at uh, contract contracting out services? Uh, I know we have uh, changes <coughs> coming up and this type of a thing, but going going out contract services, We con for example, we contract out for our uh, building official or building inspectors are contracted out. You know, we have staff uh, that the attorney is not an employee, he's a contract employee. Okay, we have less, not to pick on you too much, but uh, you know, should, should these positions that we be looking at, should they be contracted out? The prior community development director, I don't know if you still do double duty with respect to public works director and community development director. And I, I, I made this comment last couple of years. If you have one person doing two jobs, basically what you're saying is that there's not enough business or work in the city to justify either one of those positions full time. Why not contract out those services when you need it and and eliminate the pension liability, eliminate the benefits by contracting out some of the some of the upper staff. You know, um, that's my thought. I mean that, and, and and have you looked at that as an alternative for the council, or is it just strictly looking at the income side, not the expense side? I mean, the, the expenses are minimal, but if you need to get into the and, and including. I mean, I, Chief is here too. I, I think everybody should be on the table. I think that that discussion of, of going, you know, like looking at the sheriffs or something like that. I know that reared its head when reared its head when I was on the council. And of course, then no. I mean, it was we like our, you know, and we all do. We like the police, but it's kind of like we're getting down to the down to the bottom of the barrel here. I mean, we're going to be out of money in eight or nine years. I mean, we get a tax, we get a, a sales tax or whatever. How long does that fund it? Because that's, if you keep the same projections on PERS and you keep the same, you know, you know are, are, are you going to come back to the <coughs> well in, in another four or five years? If we have a structural problem, I think we have to take a look at it structurally. 
and that would mean look at contracting services and stuff like that, maybe including looking at the largest, uh, the largest cost that we have, which is police. And we have, you know, and this is not to take away from any uh, what we have, but uh, but to look at it and get the numbers and get them out on the table so that the council can make, you know, that into the mix. I mean, I've seen data put out by the sheriff's department on some of their form, you know, showing where we are, how the cities rank, contract cities versus uh, cities that have their own police forces. And on a per capita basis, we're like number two in the county, number two or three in the county for what we pay per capita for police services. We're, we're right behind, I think, Laguna Beach and Newport Beach or something like that for the average cost per capita. And maybe that's not the right I'm just saying that, that it's high, and we're high, and uh, and it would seem to me that we have to. It'd be hard to do it, but we have to look at at providing the council that data if you're trying to have them make an informed decision. So I don't know if you've done that or there's been plans to do that, but I would think that would be valuable data. I mean, to you know, to look at. It, we have uh, the budget standing committee, the council budget standing committee, uh, a few months back directed staff to look at a multitude of options. And uh, we provided information to them. There were, I believe, 21 options, most of those options being uh, staff reduction, service reduction related. Some of those were revenue enhancement, but most of them were service reduction related. And that included you know, public works, uh, development services. Uh, the police aspect of it was an estimate because in order for us to get a cost estimate from the sheriff's office, they charge for that and it's in the tens of thousands of dollars to give us a cost estimate. So we have not gone forward with that with, because that has not been directed yet by council to go to that direction. Um, I will say though that based on the preliminary work that staff did, if you do a per capita or, or per officer and officer hour comparison to what we have today, our conclusion was it was not a, a, a much of a savings at all to the city. Uh, meaning that if the sheriff's office provided the same patrol, uh, uh, patrol hours, if you will, or patrol uh, officers per capita that we currently offer, it would not be uh, much of a savings at all. Um, so again, that's not having an official formal uh, proposal from them, but it is based on uh, valuable information that we receive from other agencies, uh, departments, and looking at that information uh, and putting it, uh, you know, something together for uh, the council budget standing committee to consider. So we have looked at a lot of those options. There, uh, first to say, there there is budget uh, or cost savings associated with a lot of those, but there's also um, you know potential. Uh, reduction in service and uh, not potential the high probability of reduction in service and that's the big question as to is there a willingness and desire to see those service reductions uh, in order to see a revenue reduct you know to see a, a, a savings I should say a, a budget savings or what option I think it's probably at the end of the day a hybrid of some reductions and some revenue enhancement that's going to have to occur to make it work um, and I just, really quick to your comment with regards to will we have to come back and, and will there be a, a need to maybe look at additional revenue uh, enhancement later on? I certainly hope not, but we all know that it's, it's unforeseen as to what will transpire going forward. Uh, we have to do our best uh, in our estimations and we've taken a very conservative position in the, in the numbers that we've presented to you. Uh, for example, with sales tax, we, we took a, a very conservative estimate going forward we could see sales tax increase quite a bit going forward or we could see it drop down. So we figured better to take a lower uh, estimate on that uh, and have tried to also be realistic in, in our projections for uh, uh, you know, our cost estimates for uh, just budget you know, and, and, and our uh, expenditures here as well. So it is, it is a tough decision going forward. It's, a, it's tough to estimate. Uh, but again, I think we took a conservative position. We did provide a lot of information to the council budget standing committee that was then subsequently provided to all of the council members for their consideration. And we anticipate that that will be further reviewed and considered during the budget 
uh, or excuse me, during the fiscal sustainability workshop on uh, January 14th. Hmm. So I was curious, curious one is top three revenues and top three expenses in the city, what, what those would be. And I also wanted to get Eric's thoughts on this, is that a pensioned city employee versus a contracted employee, I would think theoretically the cost would be the same, meaning that the contracted employee is going to require a higher salary than the pensioned city employee. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I was wondering if what your, what your thoughts on that were. For example, the, for an employee who makes, you know, or for the pension on an employee, for a classic employee, let's say a, a classic police officer who's been here for 10 years, um, they, the city <coughs> pays a, approximately an additional 20%. That's the employer side of the pension formula. So okay. if the officer makes 70000 a year, for example, the the city will pay pay an additional fourteen thousand towards the pension, and the officer will pay approximately nine percent of that seventy thousand uh, dollars towards the his side of the pension as well. Okay. Um, if we contracted out every single employee, there's still that unfunded annual payment required by Calpers. So even if tomorrow all the employees left and we didn't hire anybody else, Calpers would still be still has the right to come get their one and a half million from us and that increases every year. This year was about 1.2, I should say. Next year, I think it's about 1.4. And every year that increases um, as an annual payment to PERS, regardless of the number of employees we have. Um, does, does, does that answer your question? Kind of, I mean, I, yeah. Well, yeah. at what so point does that, does that change? Well, right? I mean, because I, I saw that, you know, we've reduced our staff over the last X number of years, right, by a pretty significant headcount, 25 people. I think that's pretty dramatic for a small city like this. And so those are pensions that we're not having to fund. So at some point, just atrophy, people pass away. There is a drop-off, yes. Um, in, in about 18 to 20 years, um, CalPERS, CalPERS is requiring these annual payments. And again, with their projection, <coughs> in about 18 to 20 years, that will start to drop down. Um, but again, with the projection that long and far out, who's to say if that's really gonna come to fruition or not? But there, again, with their projections, it's about 18 to 20 years and that annual payment starts to go away. And that's just to fund our employees? <laughs> all, all of the or current and past people, anybody that's been in the pool over the last 60 years. Wow. Well, let me just give you, and, and, and again, these are, without just looking at the numbers that I've seen out there and I'll just I'm gonna pick on police I'm gonna pick on the the sheriffs and that type of a thing and keeping mind I'll, I'm not gonna say it's unsupported data but it's it's an unknown until unless the city were to do a, a diligent look at it but in comparing the, the per capita cost the savings would be about three million dollars a year to the city if you use the sheriff's data with the average the average contract city cost versus what we're paying right now if we just but that's not looking at quality of the services it's not looking at all of that stuff if you're just taking the data the difference would be the three a little over three million dollars so if you couple the three million if you could if you could generate a three million dollar savings that way and that's on the backs of the police I'm not saying to do that but that because I think I firmly th believe that if you go contract in some areas you can you can save significant money uh, and if you did have a sales tax you've got a six million dollar swing I mean that right there that if you have an 18 million dollar liability and almost in theory you could you could you could solve it in three or four years or five years I know that's not going to happen but I mean that's just using raw numbers I've done a little digging uh, the smallest we're the second smallest city in the county the smallest city in the county I think is Villa Park and they are a 100 they are 100 percent well they're they're a con basically a contract city for all services I think they have three employees three employees that are full-time uh, 
I think paying into PERS and that type of, I think. I'm, I looked at this a, a month or two ago, so my, but they have, and then how they're set up. I mean, it's almost like that's the type of data that needs to be looked at seriously because obviously the city can't keep going the way it's going. And it's like you're kicking the can down the road. If nothing changes and you add a one cent sales tax, okay, that kicks the can down the road for seven or eight, nine more years maybe, whatever. And who knows? Uh, I know in doing a little digging around, uh, there were, I think, recently there, there was a, th a $300,000 study done 300 fund and it was done this year. $300,000 study done by 15 cities. I think they were contract cities with the sheriff's department to determine uh, going into the future is this viable or should you know is is it working or whatever. And that report came out in March of this year. Did you see that? Have you looked? Have you guys looked at that? I don't. I, I mean, and. and and th there's data there. I'm just tr saying, trying to get the data to every, you get, get all the data you can so you can make the informed decision. I'm not saying to do it. I'm just saying you've got to have the information or everybody's just speculating uh, about what it might be. If it costs $10,000 for a, for a study that could save you $2 million, it, that's, that's cheap. And, and it might say no. It might, it, when it's all said and done, it says no, you're not, you're not going to get the savings you thought you were going to get. Well, that's great. That takes that off the table, and you got to find a different way to do it. I mean, but it's otherwise you just. Got, I'm just. You guys are the consultants. You're providing this information to the council. To me, it would it would seem to me you'd you'd give them enough information and places to go to try to to do a real deep dive into in, into the onto the expense side because the easy part is to do a sales tax. The easy part is to try to raise a revenue. But if it doesn't come in. Then what? I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I'm just you look at what people make, and you know, when I was on the city council, I know we got we we, we had a budget problem, and we started look. I, I, I was astonished. The the lowest paid employee secretary in here. This was in '98. Started at about thirty-five thousand a year, thirty-five or forty thousand a year. I don't know what it is now. The, the lowest paid position, it just blew me away. Uh, and because I know what we were paying secretaries and at that time, low, you know, entry level, you know, ten, <coughs> eight or nine dollars an hour, stuff like that. So I don't, I don't know, I mean, it's just, if you can contract out, it, it, you might pay the same salary, but you forego the, Pension and you forego the, the benefits, the medical and stuff like the that. The long term liability. Yeah, it's a long term. Yeah, it's long term. Yeah. So that's just my comment. I mean, that, not to. All right. Mr. Sorry. Chair, Chairman. Go ahead. If I may comment, um, <clears throat> I, I, I know that the one study you were talking about per capita uh, that uh, the Commissioner DeBull was talking about, and that came out in the paper in Orange County Register, and, and it's a way of looking at it, the cost, right? Um, if you look at it uh, per officer, per deputy, uh, the top end deputy in Orange County Sheriff's Department makes more than a sergeant does at, at Los Alamitos. And that's the fully, bo the fully benefited uh, off, uh, deputy versus a fully benefited sergeant at top end. Part of the reason why is because OSERS is no cheaper than PERS is in terms of retirement system. You've all read about that. You've seen that, you know, with... Uh, OSERS through the Sheriff's Department and even Orange County Fiber Authority. Uh, those costs are, are, are significant um, for retirement systems. Um, so when you look at it that way, and if you look at it, if you look at it not just per capita, but if you were to get like service, there is, it's impossible for that service to be cheaper than what you have it now. It, what you're paying your officers and your police department here. Uh, one of the, I think it was Chairman Lowe was, at, or, um, Commissioner Lowe was asking, you know, what's the biggest expense? Well, the police department's probably about 44% of our, you know, revenue of our operating budget. 
and uh, and it, and 78 to 82 percent of that is just personnel because it's just a service. We don't make widgets. We provide police protection 24/7. Um, so when you look at those those things, if you're not comparing apples to apples, yeah, it's a difference. So if you if and we have tried to compare apples to apples with the sheriff's department. We've looked at Stanton's contract. We've looked at um, Villa Park. We've looked at um, Dana Point, and and um, and have tried to get some numbers. But it's 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 not easy because, as the city manager indicated, mm -hmm. they don't want to be the hammer for negotiations for labor contracts. The sheriff does not want to be. If you seriously want them to look at something, you're going to have to pay them to do the study that they need to do because one of the things they need to do is find out what kind of service level they're going to provide you in the first place. If you want the same service level as Rossmore, you're not going to get dedicated deputies coming into there. You're going to get people that are, that are going to respond from, you know, Santa Ana where their deputies do. They come and they do make routine uh, patrols in that area. But they are, that's where they're housed at. There is no substation for them necessarily to operate directly from into that community. So there are a number of times when they have significant response time issues, so they'll call us. And we have a, um, a mutual aid compact with the Sheriff's Department, and they'll allow us, or not allow us, they'll ask us uh, to respond to a priority one call, and they're en route because they have a delayed response. And so we'll get there and we'll hold down the fort until they get there. Um, so uh, we're here, we have a response time of about two minutes and 46 mm -hmm. seconds to priority one calls. So we, there is a different level in service. So if you're gonna compare those things, I think Commissioner DeBold is correct. You need to look at apples to apples, you know, if that's what you wanna do. And, and we'd be willing to do that. Obviously we want, we presented numbers to the budget standing committee so they can have an idea to work from and look at that. We're not saying that, you know, if you wanted to reduce service levels of your, of your police department or police services, that you couldn't have that happen. What we do know is that there's a, there's a buy-in, say, to have a police department, a minimum amount of deployment, and we're at those numbers pretty close to right now. I mean, so if you're going to start reducing that, the strength of the police department to a lower number, then of course you're going to have to look at outsourcing it to somebody else, and that's just a fact. Um, because and, and 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 get less service, you know, as a result of that. And that's, but that may be something that's palatable or, or necessary. You know, we're not trying to make the you know decision. We're just providing some of those facts to the budget standing committee, who are eventually going to get this package to the full council. And what is it, the 14th or the? 14th of January so that they can have that discussion openly and discuss the things that have been talked about the budget cuts that we've been looking at uh, one of the things that the chairman had brought up was you know um, uh, the, some of the divestiture policies of PERS and we know that that's an issue um, I serve as the vice pre first vice president of Cal Chiefs a state organization that's been really looking at the way PERS is investing or divestiture policies and it's not been a pleasant thing and looking at the representation there, so much so that we've actually been talking to state legislators so that they quit creating legislation that uh, prevents them from investing in, you know, energy, other energy besides wind and solar, and also to get the SEC involved in doing an examination of what's going on up there. And that's what we're seeing now is that the SEC is actually thinking that they need to take a look at what PERS is doing because they are such a large you know, um, retirement system, and, uh, and, and they are beholden to the state of California and, they, and the taxpayers, and they need to make sure that their investments are being done uh, properly and appropriately. And so that is happening, um, and I don't know what that'll turn out to be, but I, I just wanted to comment on that because I know you said who's holding them accountable, but I think some of that stuff is coming uh, to a head. Um, but uh, I... Um, I know that uh, that there are a number of issues that we brought up, and, and when we take away certain things about the your own police department, there's things that if they want to live, if they want to actually house the deputies in our building where we are at, there are a lot of upgrades that are going to have to happen because they're not going to come in into uh, an inferior building. They just won't do that. They had to do the same thing at your Belinda, 
when they took over and it cost a lot of money, all the cars cost money. So there's some upfront costs that has to, for transition of those things that are part of the apples to apples comparison. But it's a study that is pretty robust and we know what your Belinda went through to have that done and the amount of uh, time it took and the amount of money it took. Um, so uh, yeah, long term, maybe it is worth that money if you were to go that route, but it is something that has to, you know, um, that really, you know, we've taken a, a pretty good look at, have provided whatever numbers that we are able to provide uh, to the Budget Standing Committee that are pretty sound, but if you really do compare those two things, uh, a deputy to the officer, like I said, a deputy, a top step deputy in the Sheriff's Department is making more than a uh, top step sergeant is at our police department, and every rank above that, it keeps, it continues to grow. Thank you. Thanks. Does anybody else uh, have any questions or comments? All right. Well, definitely a uh, big discussion. Yeah. <laughs> don't so want to be in here. Unfortunately, I don't think it's one that's uh, isolated to just our city. It's happening all over the place. And, and, uh, and I think pension liabilities and not uh, I don't want to sound like I'm not in favor of pensions. Uh, I, I'm, in, I'm not in favor of pensions that aren't appropriately funded. And there's, I think there's a, a big issue with elected officials that make you know these decisions on pensions and what they're going to pay out, and, and they don't have the follow through. They kind of kick the can and pass it on to future generations, and they don't make sure that those um, obligations are appropriately planned for and funded. And you know, it's it's catching up to a lot of us right now you know, everywhere, so big discussion. All right, anybody else? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to oral communications. Um, seeing that no one is present to speak, I will uh, move on to approval of the minutes. Uh, I have a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. <coughs> Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Can I get an aye out of you? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> motion carries. Uh, consent calendar, we have none. Public hearing, we have none. Staff report, we have none. On to uh, discussion item uh, 10A, plan sign program, PSP 1902, signage for town square at 4216 through 4390 uh, Cattell Avenue. Uh, staff report. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, Chair Riley and members of the Planning Commission, uh, Plan Sign Program 1902 is the consideration of uh, the town square um, plant signs, which are uh, Town Square is the one that has 7 uh, Eleven, Coconut Rabbit, things like that in it. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the shopping center is at 4216 to 4390, even numbers on Catella. And then there are two buildings which are part of the center, but they follow just the regular code. So, uh, but the rest of the center goes on to 4232 and 4240 Catella mm -hmm. Avenue. Uh, they're located in the commercial office zone, uh, commercial professional office zoning district. And uh, Freddie Martinez of PMX Consulting was the uh, applicant for the, uh, the, uh, the project and he was not able to make it tonight. Uh, however, it's not a, a public hearing where he would want to speak or anything like that, he said. So uh, the applicant requests the commission approval of a plan sign program that has two monument signs, uh, uh, one wall sign and, uh, per tenant bay section and one wall sign per uh, in cap tenant, um, so on the sides of the buildings. And uh, let's see, okay, the shopping center will require more than, um, it will require more than five signs, so therefore that's why they're doing the plan sign program. Uh, the plan sign program uh, was originally approved, there was one approved in 1984, 
it's aged, so they want to do a new type of signage, which you can see on the, the front of the building there. It's black and white. Uh, it's uh, approximately 48 tenant bays there. So um, there would be about, uh, with the side tenants, about 52 signs that they could possibly have. Uh, two of the signs at the entrance, let's bring up the signage here. Those are the, the buildings there that are part of this. A, B, and C, which is uh, the main section. And then uh, D is the section on the other side of Orange County mattress. It has subway and, and places like that. OK, so the, uh, the subway building has a short um, monument sign. And that is well within code. Um, the uh, larger ones, though, um, they uh, have extra address signage on the bottom, which when you pull up to that uh, the corner there uh, for a brief moment until you pull out a little bit farther, it's more difficult to see traffic and pedestrians as they're walking up the street. So staff has made a suggestion in condition 12 uh, that um, they place that elsewhere on a signage um, uh, with director's um, opinion on how um, where to place it um, later on uh, and uh, the uh, applicant is fine with that I've talked with them about that uh, and uh, the other signs are, are basically like what's on every other building in this town so that it's uh, not not much of a leap uh, on this plan sign program other than the, than the fact that it is black and white and is kind of hard to see in that picture. Let me bring that back up again. Uh, not as clear to see as the, the signs with a white background are right now. But uh, they've talked to the uh, lessees of the building and they are fine with it. So uh, I'm not sure, you know, how that discussion went. But, but so far uh, I've been told that they're fine with it. Uh, staff recommends approval of plan sign program 1902 to replace plan sign program 184. Uh, back to you. Thank you. Uh, questions? Mm -hmm. Comments? No. Be nice for that. Be a nice change for down there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, so with that, I'll um, open the public hearing, see if anyone would like to come forward and speak on this item. Uh, all right, and we have no one present to come forward and speak on this item, so I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Uh, we have a, uh, I'll a make discussion a motion. or a motion. Or I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Uh, motion carries. All right. That takes us to item uh, 10B, resolution of intention. Uh, staff report, please. Yes. Um, Chair Riley and members of the Planning Commission. This is a resolution of intention um, that staff brings to you tonight. Um, based on direction, uh, the state has directed cities to allow for accessory dwelling units and uh, family daycare homes uh, in an easier fashion, fashion than they have been in the past. And uh, so therefore we need to come up with new codes in order to uh, meet what the state uh, has directed, um, but still have what little control we do over that. Uh, so there, if we don't make a decision in the next few months, we follow what the state has uh, directed for accessory dwelling units and family daycare homes. Um, so we're asking you tonight to uh, uh, allow discussion in the next few meetings, uh, not necessarily the very next meeting, but when we get that written um, and uh, that it starts with a resolution of intention. So uh, back to you, Chair Riley. All right, thank you. Um, questions, comments for staff? 
so the family daycare is just it's it's not the uh, it's just for, it's for this is children the children yes for daycare yeah yeah age uh, up to uh, ten I believe yeah, yeah. Anything else? They, they still fall under state regulations as to how many they can have at one time present and how many bedrooms and everything. Um, yeah, there's there's some of that. I probably should defer to the city attorney yeah. about that. I'm sorry, what was the question that these uses would still be subject to state regulations concerning yes. the physical premises and so forth? How many if they can have there at a time, how many bedrooms, how many, everything they have to have for this? Yeah, they would still be required to obtain all licensing through the state. It's really just a, a limitation on the city's ability to regulate from the land use side or to treat these now large family daycare units as anything other than a residential use that someone should be able to implement without any sort of city approval. Anything else? This is public hearing. No. No, this is just an intention. So if if this is granted, if the resolution is approved, then we draft the language, it comes back to you in a public hearing would be conducted at that time, then you'd be making a recommendation to city council and they would subsequently conduct a public hearing as well. Okay. And will we hold any liability to anything of, on this at all or there's nothing by them changing and increasing this? If, I, the liability sure. of anybody being of any of these children injured because of the changes in the code or we have protection for us we would not incur any additional liability um, by virtue of these uses now being permitted without our oversight it's just more kids in the neighborhood <laughs> all right um, so any other discussion? Okay. No. Um, I have a motion. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. Motion to what? Approve. <laughs> <laughs> further discussion, right? <laughs> it's, it's to approve the resolution of intention. All right. Uh, okay. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, none. Motion carried. And I guess we'll look for this one coming back to us with more detail at a future date. Yes. All right. Um, we have no items from the. Oh, do we have any items from the Development Services Director? Just very briefly, uh, Mr. Chair, Commission members, I wanted to report that uh, at the City Council meeting this past Monday evening, there was a public hearing held on the. 4281 Catella property that was just recently before you that was a proposed general plan amendment and change of zone for that two-story office building and that item was considered and uh, unanimously approved so it'll, the one portion that requires warrants will go to second reading during the January meeting but uh, there was no additional public testimony the same essentially the same correspondence came from the neighboring Arrowhead property and nobody else spoke regarding that item so uh, that appears to be going forward with approval as per your recommendation. Again, just want to, as a reminder, if you're interested, uh, once again, the Fiscal Sustainability Workshop of City Council will be held on January 14th, which is actually a Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. here in the Council Chambers. And then finally, uh, on behalf of staff and myself, we want to wish each and every one of you and your families a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and Happy New Year. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, commissioner reports, anything? Well, just have a nice holiday. Yeah, I think I would like to say the same thing to all of my fellow <coughs> commissioners up here and to staff. Thanks for all the hard work um, from everybody. I said it at the Christmas party, but I mean, staff really does the heavy lifting and makes our job easier up here. Uh, so thank you for that. And, uh, and thank you for the participation from all my fellow commissioners up here and uh, happy holidays. Just one comment. 
same thing. Happy holidays and have a good have a good Christmas. And then, since our uh, at the last meeting, I raised a question regarding the uh, requirement we had in the approval on the apartment the new apartments up here about recording the uh, uh, the notification or the you know the, about the uh, remedial work for the hazardous waste on the site. Did that language ever get? worked out we've revisited that with the applicant and they're working on getting it recorded so it is in process um, also with regards to just reporting on the site the remediation work is now complete and they're just waiting on the appropriate agency to give the final authority uh, but everything has indicated to us it's been successfully remediated and uh, they should be starting to import soil and uh, working on, uh, we're ready to issue a, a, a building permit once that clearance is granted. So um, it was quite an arduous process. It went very quickly, uh, but as some of you may have experienced firsthand, it was, it was uh, fairly uh, strong and in, in odor at times, uh, but they were successful in being able to clear it out rather quickly. We're thankful for that because I know the adjacent property to the west took much longer than this remediation exercise, but uh, uh, again, they, they should be importing the, uh, the clean uh, dirt here soon. And again, the Water Quality Board has indicated to us that everything is uh, successful. We're just waiting for the final documentation to represent that. And are we going to have, are we going to hold up the permit until until, 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 until they get the, That's that, that yeah, condition we've, taken we've care of? We've notified them of that. <clears throat> okay, good. All right. Anyone else? <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned.